Here we go. Uh, so uh, a little bit of apology there for a slightly late start. Uh, our job today is to talk about spatial localization too, sort of the second part of um, uh, spatial localization in general. I'll spend a few minutes going back over just the kind of high points from the last lecture, and then we'll get into some 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 of the most difficult concepts I think actually in our which are phase and frequency encoding. And we'll handle that in a couple of different ways, kind of the normal some qualitative aspects, and then we'll try to get to some quantitative aspects as well. Um, I'm feeling 100% mediocre. Uh, I got sick again. This is not my favorite thing. Uh, it is what it is, but I'm probably going to sit down for most of the lecture. Uh, hopefully that's not a problem. Um, so quickly, a little bit of class business. Uh, there's already been a few things sort of pointed out here. Uh, but let's just go through quick. So homework one, homework two are back. Uh, homework one, people have done regrades and I posted the solution, so you should be able to get those two. Homework two, um, generally the score was good. Uh, there's you know there's there's people that are absolutely nailing it, and there's people that are still maybe having a little bit of a hard time with some of the concepts. Totally get it. My job is to help you learn this material, right? And my job to with the TAs is to help you learn this material. Um, someone had asked previously uh, earlier today if there would be a regrade option for homework two. Uh, I'm open to that. Uh, but in fairness, I have to offer that to everybody. So, you know, what's, what's, what's it going to be? Is it, is it worth it to you to do it? Uh, that's, that's sort of up to you. Um, you know, I think if you can make up, you know, three, four, five points, five is probably hard, uh, then, it, then it's probably worth it. If you're only going to make up a half point or a point, it's probably not really going to affect your grade. And then if at the end, you think it affected your Um, so, so that being said, uh, you've got a lot going on, right? Because you've got homework three, which is due later this week. You've got the lab, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then if you want to do a regrade for homework two, uh, fine. Uh, but I also don't want to give you a lot of time to do that because then that will compound sort of how well you can do on the other assignments and things. Uh, so as it's Tuesday today, let well, me we'll say you've got a week uh, to get those back to me. Um, so next Tuesday, and again, if, if, if you're really only going to come out, you know, sort of you'll get half credit for the um, regrade. So if you're only going to come out you know, half a point or a point ahead of time, it might not be worth your time. I can't tell you not to. Yeah, you uh, but that would be how I would sort of make that decision. Uh, so yeah, good. Okay. Uh, if you do want to take that option, uh, send me an email so I can sort of coordinate it with the TAs and, and sort of just balance with your expectations for what they need to get done. Um, so the other thing we have coming up is the lab. I don't know if there was some confusion about that. I apologize if there, if there was. These are the dates that we had uh, from the very beginning of the, of the first lecture. I think uh, the website's a little confusing because the labs sort of show up as if they, they look as if they're on Tuesday or Thursday. So I'm sorry if that was confusing. But we do have lab one tomorrow from the 6th of So hopefully that's not a conflict for anyone. Um, these are the groups that got put together. And they got put together for different reasons. Some of you offered that you wanted some in particular, and they just accommodated that for the most part. Uh, but then there's a couple uh, typos here, I think, already, because we've got uh, James, uh, Jenning, and then I think uh, Jermaine and Jenning are the same person, right? Uh, so th there'll, be a, there'll be a little uh, reworking of the groups, but I think every group, I think it's okay, uh, because this group here has four people, and so, sorry, Jenning, James, is James here? He's at Cedars right now. Okay, so we'll, we'll tell him later. But I think what we'll do is we'll just keep him in this prisoner group here with Tyler and with Tyson. Um, and that way it just keeps three people in each group. So that's easy. That will be easy. And then you and you were on here twice as well. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I see. So I think, I think it'll be. Okay. Why don't you uh, why don't you go ahead and stick with this is the group that you guys sort of self nominated so why don't you just stick with that group and then Kathy and Carol you guys can work together I don't, I don't think you need someone there for conflict resolution okay. as long as as long as she makes it and Carol makes it in James for her yeah it stinks uh, so we'll find out if we're working on the questions okay so I guess the main question about the labs or first and foremost is there a conflict is there is anyone looking at this and saying Sorry, just can't do it. Or it would be way better because I got hot data at 8.30 if I could be in 
So I'm going to assume that the group assignments are fine aside from the kind of little bit of confusion. Um, the way this will work, first group is going to show up at 6. Do you guys know where to go? I should have put that in the slide, but I didn't. It was in the very first lecture slides. You're going to meet outside the Medical Plaza 300 building. Um, so I think this first group, for the most part, knows where the MR systems are. And same place we went for 205 lab, right? Uh, Tyler, you certainly know. Uh, you guys will fill in James. And then you know, I think, do you know where to go? It's like not where my office is, but kind of outside my office. There's an outdoor observer. Sort of okay, you can talk to yeah. Tyler about it. Um, uh, what about sort of folks that are in the later group? You guys know where to where to meet up? Is it the front door or the back? It's like the back door. Okay. Yeah. And so um, if you go back to the lecture one slide, sorry, I was gonna try to write the other one. Actually, let's just do this a different one. It's the same, yeah, same door we went in for 180L. And so if you're, um, I always use Diddy Reese as a landmark, right? So Diddy Reese is here, right? And then this is, uh, is that Broxon? Broxon. Uh, no, that's the phone. Or no, this is yeah, the phone, yeah. right? That's Broxon. This is the phone. And this is Broxon. And right on this corner here, is the UROC building. That's where my office is. So if you've come to office hours or you've met with the TA, it's my office is roughly there. There's another building that's right here. This is the MP300 building. It's called Medical Plaza 300. Uh, and we're going to meet just right outside on that kind of corner. Okay. The rest of the UCLA campus is up this way, and Westwood Boulevard is right over here. If one or two of you are there, the rest of you will. That's the best place. That's the best place. To, that's the best place to eat. If you go back to the lecture one slides with a handout, you'll see it's sort of marked. Um, but meet me there. Some of you know exactly how to get all the way to the scanners, but I prefer that you don't do that, just so I can sort of coordinate everyone together and get you into the scanners together. Uh, sometimes we have patients that are still finishing up scans and things like that. But just mindful that people are doing something very personal and we come into like the scanners. Okay. So I think I think we're probably good. Uh, the lab assignment will be posted. There's really not a lot to do before the lab. The basic idea behind the lab is that we're going to have a specific object that you guys can image, and you'll be able to make some adjustments and changes to things like the field of view and the spatial resolution and so forth. And what we'll be reconstructing on the scanner will be, I think, both an image of the object, but also its Fourier transform. And so you'll be learning to you know, sort of get an appreciation between how it is that MR imaging actually encodes and acquires all the data of the Fourier domain uh, to, and then ultimately produce an image uh, that's interesting as well. So you, you'll do some relatively simple experiments, but get familiar with operation of the scanner uh, at the same time. And then that'll lead into our second lab, which is a couple weeks later, uh, where we'll get to play with the scanners. Uh, I'll, post the, I'll try to post the lab tonight so you can read it, but there's really not a whole lot to do in terms of like pre-lab, except for to read it so you're familiar with it. The TAs will be there. Um, there is an MR safety screening form, uh, and I would ask that you fill out the screening form. This serves two purposes. One is it familiarizes you with sort of what's required for patients that are going to undergo an MR exam. It's going to ask a bunch of questions about basically whether or not you have medical devices implanted in you uh, or other sort of you know, claustrophobia concerns, this kind of stuff. This is the screening form we use for patients. You're not going to, as individuals, you're not going to be going inside the actual scanner itself. But I would like to bring you into the MR room so we can sort of see the scanners and play with them a little bit. Um, so please fill out that form. I'll post it as part of the lab assignment, which should just be one PDF. Um, it'll, it'll ask for some personal information. I don't need it. I don't need your phone number. I don't need your address. I certainly don't need your social or anything like that. But your name and your signature, just so that I have a record that everyone sort of had a discussion with me about any possible safety considerations for them going into the MR scanner. I have to take that really seriously. Uh, and I want you guys to know what that process looks like. That's part of this class. Uh, and then I want to make sure I can keep everyone safe. Um, we, don't, we haven't had problems before. Uh, most of you are young, healthy, fit 
people, but when you have questions or concerns or you're not sure, you know, if under these circumstances you should go in that room, just ask me. If you're not comfortable talking with me, I can arrange for you to talk with one of the techs or one of the nurses. So there's, there's lots of ways to handle this, but safety is the, is the main thing. Uh, when it comes to the most, most of the questions are usually about your belt, your sunglasses, or if you have like braces. Uh, and your braces will be fine, your belt should be fine, and your glasses depend. Like, poor choice in eyeglass wear, these are ferromagnetic, uh, but I didn't think to ask that question when I went to go pick out glasses. Uh, Okay, so I'll post that this evening, you can look at it. So this is uh, what we're uh, really in the middle of uh, uh, for, the, for the class at least, which is it's this idea of spatial encoding, right? And there were three key steps, slice selection, phase encoding, and frequency encoding. And last time we really only talked about slice selection, this idea that you have to pick an RF pulse in a particular way so that you excite the slice that you actually care about. I'll go over a couple of those concepts kind of uh, just in review. And then we'll talk more about phase encoding and frequency encoding. So there was a lot of factors, right, that you can control and adjust in terms of how you pick your slice uh, or how you excite the slice that you're interested in. And the one that we spent probably the most amount of time on was the uh, was to try to get a better understanding of the pulse envelope function. And what we worked through was called the small tip angle approximation. If you make this kind of funny assumption that the Z magnetization doesn't really change at all, it, it actually doesn't decrease even though you're generating transverse magnetization, even though you're tipping the spin system over. If you make that assumption, you get this really interesting result, which is that the slice profile is just the Fourier transform of the envelope function. And so that gives us some leverage, gives us some insight for figuring out how we would possibly design this envelope function. Turns out the design of that envelope function is really complex. There's, there's, there's a lot of details that go into that. The entire course is taught on, on pulse design. Uh, so uh, the depth of understanding you're going to get from this class is not going to be especially deep. Uh, what I want you to at least appreciate is this Fourier transform relationship between the envelope function and the slice profile. And there are other things that were, that were related to that pulse envelope function. You might have, for example, on any given system, a B1 maximum. Uh, the pulse itself will have a bandwidth. Here, bandwidth used in a different context today as well. Here, we're thinking of what we call the excitation bandwidth. We want to excite a particular center frequency. That center frequency is sort of like the, the middle of the slice. But we also want our slice to have some finite thickness. And so we have to excite a range of frequencies around the center frequency. And we refer to that as the bandwidth, or more specifically, the excitation bandwidth. And then, of course, another governing sort of factor here is the flip angle. We want to tip the spins by a certain amount, whether we're just trying to do a gradient echo sequence with a 5 or 10 degree flip angle, or we need a big refocusing or an inversion pulse. Uh, so, so those are different things that we control uh, when designing the B1 envelope function. We talked about the excitation uh, set of frequency. I'll we'll look at that again really quickly. And then, of course, we have to adjust the gradient amplitude, because it's only the combination of the RF pulse with the gradient that gives us slice selectivity. Uh, and so we have to design that gradient as well. And so we talked about really two components there, and we'll look at some examples as well. But you have to design the, the trapezoid that corresponds with the timing of the RF pulse itself. And then there's a second gradient called the slice select refocusing gradient. Does anyone remember what the slice select refocusing gradient was for? So what a, what a, take a whack at describing that. Uh, yeah, why? Um, You're exactly right. Uh, yeah, uh, it's use use a, a good keyword there. Refocuses the magnetization, right? So you have to you have to remember our slices have a thickness, and across the thickness of that slice, at the end of excitation, when we've just played the RF pulse with the gradient, at the end of just that block event. Through the thickness of our slice, we will have tipped our spins over by whatever we designed in our RF pulse, let's think of it as 90 because that's easy, but through the thickness of our slice, our spins will actually have different phases. And that's not obvious, but it's a consequence of playing an RF pulse and playing a gradient at the same time. You will have some through slice dephasing through the thickness of the slice. But we know how much dephasing there's going to be. We can, we can predict it, we can calculate it, 
And so as a consequence, we can turn on an equal and opposite gradient, and all that space that we wound up through the slice, we can unwind by playing an equal and opposite in phase of gradient. We'll look at an example again, but that's the, the principle. And anytime you have dephasing, right, dephasing causes signal loss. And so this gets back to the point he was making about uh, refocusing the spin system. All the spins point in the same direction again. That's, of course, going to give us better signal to <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I, I won't uh, spend too much time on this because this is just a review. But how do we pick the, the center frequency? Well, the center frequency for our RF pulse has to correspond to the slice that we actually want to excite. And when we turn on a gradient, we get a range of larmer frequency, right? So at isocenter, we just have the normal larmer frequency, but as we get farther and farther from isocenter, uh, slice A, for example, it's at a higher frequency. We just have to tune that center frequency to match this particular slice. And then it stands to reason as you tune up or tune down that RF center frequency, you can actually excite different slices in the body. So that's one way to adjust the, the slice. Uh, the other thing is our slices are not infinitely thin, right? We have a thickness associated with those slices. And so our RF pulse has to have a certain excitation bandwidth that when, which means that it excites a range of frequencies, right? Typically on the order of 1,000 to even 10,000 hertz. Uh, and so when we turn on a gradient, we have a range of frequencies. And if our RF pulse also has a range of frequencies, and you can see where we, where we can calculate the excitation bandwidth is just being the gradient strength times the delta z, the thickness of the slice. Uh, if our pulse includes that range of frequencies, then in principle, we'll be exciting spins over that range of, of z positions or over that range of angles. And so in reverse, normally we pick our, our, uh, our delta z. We know what our slice, if you sit down with the scanner, you're going to pick your slice thickness, 4 millimeters, 10 millimeters, whatever. Uh, you're usually going to have some constraint on your RF pulse. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, but we don't we don't choose in general to have really long RF pulses, hundreds of milliseconds. So there's some constraint on how short of an RF pulse we want to use. And once your RF pulse or its the excitation bandwidth is constrained and your slice thickness is constrained, then you're just calculating the, the required gradient strength. Uh, as long as you don't exceed the maximum that your system is capable of, uh, then you'll then you'll be okay. Sure. And so here's just a, a slightly different example saying, well, what happens if we take uh, we have the same RF pulse, or at least it has the same excitation bandwidth, uh, but we turn on a steeper gradient. Two things have happened in turning on a steeper gradient if we use the exact same RF pulse. We've actually shifted slightly the slice position, right, because the center frequency now corresponds to a different uh, Z position, if you will. And uh, because we also have a, a, a steeper gradient, uh, we have, uh, we have steeper changes in frequency per unit distance. And so that same excitation uh, bandwidth corresponds to an actually a thinner slice. And so there's, there's trade-offs here, and, and really all of them are as trade-offs. But this is just an example of showing what happens if I use the same RF pulse, but I steepen my gradient. I'll actually move the slice position slightly uh, and change its thickness. Now, it's easy if I want to get that slice position back up to the head, for example. I can just change the center frequency. But in combination, the RF bandwidth and the, and the strength of the gradient will uh, affect your slice thickness and so on. <laughs> uh, these were examples that we talked about last time. I sort of just went over. Um, this is just a little bit more detail about, uh, about RF pulses. And so this is a concept I don't think we, uh, we got into it last time. There's this concept of what's called the time bandwidth product for an RF pulse. And it just is, uh, it's the product of two things. It's the pulse duration. So our RF pulses will be finite in duration, usually a few milliseconds or a couple hundred microseconds. And then the pulse also has a bandwidth. And we talked about the excitation bandwidth just a second ago. And so if this has units of time and this has units of frequency, uh, then ultimately that thing will be unitless. So we call it the time bandwidth product. It's a useful description to characterize sort of uh, one way of characterizing it. It's also related to the number of zero crossings. And so if we think of RF pulses as being sync pulses, every time they cross a zero, you can count that, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you have eight zero crossings, it turns out your time bandwidth product is really close to eight kilohertz. It depends specifically. Uh, your time bandwidth product is eight. Uh, the excitation 
Um, so we can pick pulses to either be low time bandwidth products or high time bandwidth products. If you choose a high time with uh, high time with bandwidth, high time bandwidth RF pulse, uh, that means you're going to have a large number of zero crossings. Right, your RF pulse is going to is going to oscillate many many times. Think about a single pulse, for example. Uh, if you can accommodate that, and you have the time to do so, then you'll have fewer truncation RF packs. Anytime you have to, remember, the, the, the perfect RF pulse is like a single pulse that's infinitely long, right? Because its, it's Fourier transform will be a rect function. And as soon as you start truncating that single pulse down to something less than infinite, then you're going to have truncation RF packs. A larger number of zero crossings means you've truncated it less, and so consequently you'll have fewer truncation artifacts, and the slice profile will be better. But the expense is that it's going to be a longer duration pulse. So again, so many things in MR are, are, are trade-offs. So we could look at we could look at some some simple examples. I think this is what happens on the next slide. But we can think about a time bandwidth product four pulse, uh, and, and this is meant to be the RF duration is one millisecond. So we can then calculate what's the excitation bandwidth, and then maybe what's the required gradient strength for a one centimeter slice. So the examples on the next slide, and then you could reconsider this if you had a much higher time. So let's go ahead and look at an example. So on the top here, this is the excitation bandwidth expression that I gave you a little while ago. And it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's just saying that the range of frequencies uh, in your RF pulse, or the, the range of frequencies that you want, corresponds to uh, the strength of your gradient times the slice thickness that you're interested in deciding. And so we can you know, turn this equation around in different ways if we want to calculate, say, just the GZ. So let's start off with uh, the bandwidth for our RF pulse. The bandwidth for the RF pulse is just the same as the time bandwidth product divided by the duration of the RF pulse. That just comes from this definition of the time bandwidth product. Sometimes it's convenient to describe it as a time bandwidth product, four pulse, eight pulse, 16 pulse. And the example I had on the previous slide was that the time bandwidth product was four, and it was a one millisecond pulse. And so that meant that the bandwidth of that pulse is four kilohertz. And so, if I design that pulse, or if I use that pulse, I'll be exciting a range of frequencies of about four kilohertz on top of my larmer frequency, the center frequency excitation. So now if I know what the bandwidth of my RF pulse is, I can go back to trying to calculate what's the gradient strength I need to excite a specific slice thickness. And in this case, we're saying, well, I know what my range of frequency is, gamma is just a constant, and delta Z, uh, was my target slice thickness on the previous slide. I said, well, why don't we try to excite a slice of 10 millimeters? And so the point of this exercise is to say, once you know, say, the time bandwidth product and the RF pulse duration, you can get the excitation bandwidth for the RF pulse and then calculate the gradient strength that's actually required during that excitation. And we find that we get about uh, not quite one gauss per centimeter. Um, Conceptually, you should be able to rework this for a different time bandwidth product pulse, uh, different RF uh, uh, excitation bandwidth, or a different slice thickness. Um, we can carry through one simple example. So let's say I want to have a slice thickness of five millimeters. What's going to happen to my gradient strength? It's going to double, right? So if I want a thinner slice, five millimeter slice, then my GZ is going to go up by a factor of two. And that's fine. Right now I'm only at one gauss per centimeter, and I'm saying I need to go to two gauss per centimeter. No problem. Uh, at a certain point, however, if your slice gets thin enough, you'll actually exceed what your system is capable of. Right? You can only go up to certain gradient maximums. Uh, we're nowhere close to the maximum at this point. But when you start getting down to uh, slice thicknesses of about a millimeter, where this goes up to, say, 9.4 gauss per centimeter, you've probably exceeded what those systems are capable of. They're usually capable of five to eight gauss per centimeters. Okay, so there was another example on the previous slide for a time bandwidth product of 16, and you can work through the same example to see well, what happens if I have that higher time bandwidth product. It'll have, better, it'll have a better slice profile, but it'll have some implications for uh, the gradient strength that you can use, for example. <coughs> Um, and so this, uh, this is pulled just from the last slide, just as review. So how do we pick the envelope function, this B1 envelope function, right? Uh, we know or, or hopefully understand now that the B1 envelope function determines what we call the slice profile. Ideally, we would have a rect profile, right? All spins to the thickness of the slice would be uniformly and equivalently 
excited. That's only going to be the case for an infinitely long sync pulse. There we obviously have a problem. Um, so changing the shape of that envelope function uh, is going to change the available excitation bandwidth. We could look at this uh, pulse here, and we can count zero crossings, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this has a time bandwidth product of eight. Uh, and that's a, that's a reasonably high time bandwidth product for our pulses that we actually use in MR, simply because the duration gets to be on the long side for, for eight. Uh, so, so then the question is, how do we how do we know what shape to, to, to use here? Well, part of it comes out of that small tip angle approximation where we saw that the slice profile is related to the Fourier transform of that B1 envelope function. And so now we can pick different B1 envelope functions to get the slice profile we want. So this is an example of a possible excitation profile that you would get. What does it mean? Um, well, I probably should have put some dashed lines on here which would represent like the ideal slice profile. Ideal slice profile would be uniform excitation from the beginning of the slice to the end of the slice, right? What you see in this example here, let's assume that the slice thickness, the target slice thickness is maybe close, close to this minimum, just to keep this on the same page. Uh, what it means is that at the very edges of the slice, we have very little excitation, and then as we get, you know, pretty quickly it rises to having, say, the, the target level of Excitation. You've tipped over the spin to the amount you wanted to, but across the thickness of the slice, the excitation is non-uniform. What does that mean? Well, it means that the available transverse magnetization is slightly different across the thickness of the slice. And that, another way of saying that is the flip angle is slightly different as you go across the slice. Maybe your target at flip angle is 90 degrees, but what you're getting is this little subtle oscillation from you know, 95 to 85 degrees. So you have an imperfect slice profile. All of those excited spins are being received by your coil, but they're, they've been excited to a different degree, so that has some funny effect on the signal that you actually want to, uh, that you know, you're trying to interpret the signal as a representation of the underlying object, and you're going to have some unusual sort of averaging, if you will, of excitation across the thickness that's not perfectly uniform. The other problem you have is outside of these minima, you can see that there's some excitation, right? That means that outside of your desired slice thickness, the 10 millimeters that you wanted to excite, there was some excitation of spins. And so now you have spins, and they might be small in number, but they can still contribute to the overall, they will still contribute to the overall received signal. And this is called out of slice excitation, right? You had a target slice, but some spins still got excited. It might only be by five or 10 degrees, but it's enough to, to become part of the signal that you're measuring. Right? And whether or not that's a, a major artifact for you or not depends on, on the overall quality of your RF pulse. As you, as you uh, decrease the time bandwidth product, right, we could go down to a time bandwidth product two pulse. So it would just be like the center hump here. The slice profile won't look very good at all. It'll have large ringing in the middle here, and it'll have a lot of out of slice excitation, right? And that just means you're getting some really unusual sort of information from not just the slice you want, but stuff outside of that slice and none of it has the flip angle that you really want, right? So again, MR, lots of trade-offs. We want, in principle, high time bandwidth product pulses with really nice tight slice profiles, but that's not always possible. You're either gonna hit some, some acceptable duration limit, you don't want your RF pulses to be 100 milliseconds long, or you could start hitting hard limits as well, gradient strength, for example. Um, and then, the, sort of the last concept uh, that I wanted to go back over, was this idea, and we talked about it just a second ago actually, was this post-excitation refocusing, or sometimes called slice-select refocusing. And the key word was really refocusing. If you look at uh, this result here is the result from the small tip angle approximation. And what it tells us is that the slice profile at the end of the RF pulse, this, this tau P sneaks in from time to time. It's the same as tau RF, the duration of the RF pulse. So the, the state of transverse magnetization at the end of the RF pulse depends on this expression here. There's some constant terms that are in the front, and then there's the Fourier, what looks like the Fourier transform of that B1 function. Uh, didn't, I don't know why it's written in DX, it's uh, my fault. Bottom line is that at the end of excitation, there is this constant term, and this is the through plane dephase image. 
you have, a, you have a thickness to your slice, you want to tip everything over by 90, and you do, but they all end up with slightly different phase through that slice. And if they're all pointing in slightly different directions, your signal's noise goes down. Fortunately, because it's a constant term, we can deal with it, and we can just apply a gradient that's of equal and opposite um, uh, area or amplitude uh, and deal with that problem. And so it can be fixed just by, multi so, so to speak, multiplying the magnetization by e to the minus i gamma g delta z times half the duration of the arm of this. And so we, we, know, we know what that effect comes from, we know what it looks like, and so we can consequently uh, turn it around. And so what that looks like <coughs> is just, again, applying a gradient at the very end here that's of the opposite amplitude and at least half the duration of the RF pulse. What really matters is just the area uh, of the second gradient. So the area of this refocusing gradient needs to be equal to half the area of the slice select gradient. And that'll, uh, for the most part, give you perfect refocusing. Now, when it comes down to like real RF pulses and the, and, the, and, the, and the true amount of refocusing needed for a specific RF pulse, sometimes you can only get there through simulation. And so the small tip angle approximation has its limits. Uh, but we can always simulate this whole thing, and, and uh, what you can find for certain RF pulses is they can, they can design what are called minimum phase RF pulses, so they'll generate the least amount of phase or the minimum amount of phase through the slice, and you may in fact be able to correct for the residual phase with a, with a different area. So the, the details can, can get complicated, I only point to it as something that you might hear about if you get into this research. Uh, topic. Yeah. Is the one half factor Conceptually, I think that's a, a really good way to think about it. Uh, if you go back to some of the movies I was showing before, I don't think I have any excitation movies uh, in this one. But, but yeah, conceptually, this first half of the gradient, the spin system is kind of just wobbling around a little bit. The RF amplitude isn't really all that strong. You're not really tipping over too much. And if you haven't tipped over very much, it's, you don't really accumulate much in the way of phase. And then it's not until the, really the middle of this pulse where all the B1 energy is going in, and now things are really starting to tip over. And then the gradient really starts giving some phase to that spin system. So conceptually, that's that's kind of the right idea. The, the details are a little more subtle, but yeah. Okay. So that's what I had, I think, for the um, for the review of sort of the slice select uh, stuff that we talked about last. Time. Uh, and then the plan for today uh, is is we'll look at the MR signal equation one more time. Uh, I want to talk again about sort of what different points, and not really even just points, but different regions in K-space represent. Uh, again, try to build your conceptual framework for what is K-space. Uh, and then uh, we'll understand more so the connection between the Fourier encoding and image acquisition. Uh, in, the, in the coming lectures, we'll actually get more into what we call the image reconstruction problem. Here, we're talking about all the signals we acquire and why they tell us something important about our underlying state of the magnetization. The image reconstruction problem uh, is, is sort of the inverse of that. How do we take all that information we acquired and then turn it into an image? So that's coming uh, later. Uh, and then you should be able to understand both qualitatively and quantitatively both phase and frequency encoding. These are, these are probably two of the more difficult topics in this class to sort of get a real good intuition for, but I'll try to build up some of that and then you'll have to let it sink in and then you'll have to look at some things and we'll come back to it. Um, <clears throat> so that's the that's the plan. Uh, I think this will only go for uh, roughly an hour. Uh, we'll, we'll see either either uh, we'll hit the wall at six o'clock or we're off the wall earlier than that. Uh, but let's get talking about case spacing. So this we've seen several times, but it's but it's it's worth emphasizing because I, I I really want you guys to have some intuition and understanding for this, right? You have some object that you're trying to image. That's why I show it as an object here, and specifically not an image, right? This is the object that's in the standard. And we understand pretty well now how to use saturation pulses or inversion pulses or whatever to manipulate the state of the transverse magnetization. And having manipulated the state of the transverse magnetization, we now need to form an image. And so that's the next sequence of events, right? Manipulate the, the, the transverse magnetization, and now we have to be able to form an image. So how do we go about doing that? Well, really remarkably, uh, I think, is through the application of a gradient, and that's all this is, that's what this term here tells us, is we can apply a gradient. The gradient tells us about our k vector and integral relationship between 
point in K space or position in K space in the applied uh, gradient. We'll see that uh, expression show up again in just a second. But what's really fascinating here is you take the state of the transverse magnetization, you play an additional gradient to manipulate the phase and frequency of the transverse magnetization, and that's what you will pick up in your nearby coil. Right? So the last part of this expression is saying, I've got a coil that's nearby, it's listening to the, the, to the object, and all the object can do is have processing magnetization that induces a current in my coil and I can receive that. Our job is to encode contrast information, that's the first thing, but our job is also to encode spatial uh, information, that's the second thing. And that's what the MR signal equation tells us, is that this is the way to do it. We can, we can uh, uh, measure the signal at a particular position in K space if we manipulate the contrast of the object and then multiply by the right spatial frequency pattern. And that's what our that's the signal that will be received for that sort of that short period of time. Now, generating this pattern in our magnetization this is relatively straightforward. We're just going to apply a gradient. Um, and once that pattern has been sort of instilled into the magnetization, the processional frequency is so fast. You'll see this in your, in your homework assignment that you're working on right now. During very short periods of time, microseconds, we'll have hundreds of cycles of precession, right? And so that's what's really neat about MR is it operates across very, very different sort of time scales. And so we can, on the scale of, you know, many micro, tens of microseconds, impart these patterns on the underlying object. And every time we generate a pattern like this, we can listen with our receiver, pick up hundreds of cycles of precession and say, oh, okay, that's what the amplitude is for that particular pattern in this particular object. And our job then is to move around all of K-space, and we'll talk more about that, but we'll have to move around all of K-space by applying the right gradients, and this happens through the process of phase and frequency encoding, such that we can impart all of these different patterns on the underneath underlying object, and basically ask through the coil, is that pattern present? No? Okay. What about this pattern? Is this pattern present? Yes? No? Okay. What about this pattern? And just move through literally hundreds of these patterns until we can assemb assemble the presence or absence of all of those patterns as amplitudes of different cables. That's, that's the underlying imaging process. And it's really, you know, it's a total stroke of genius. It's hard enough to understand it. It's, a, it's another level of genius to invent it. But uh, that's what uh, uh, Mansfield and Lauderdale. And so uh, we know now that what this is telling us here is about the amplitude, for example, of a single point in K space. And if we play different gradients to manipulate different patterns like this, we can march around to different points in K space. Now, it turns out it'd be rather silly if, if what you chose to do was to get this point in K space, and then get this point in K space, and then get this point in K space, and then get this point in K space. In K space. That would be a pretty inefficient thing to do. What we'll see is by turning on a gradient, you can generate a pattern like this. The longer that gradient is turned on for, the higher and higher and higher in spatial frequency that pattern becomes. And that's why as we move from, say, one point in K-space, well, let's say as we move from the middle of K-space, as that gradient's turned on, we're encoding higher and higher spatial frequency information just by leaving that gradient on. And the readout gradient, for example, does just move us from the middle of K-space, say, out to the edge of K-space. A little detail there, we'll talk about coming out to this other side of K-space when we look at the, the practice of gradient vectors. Um, and then what you'll come to understand more so in the image reconstruction lectures is how it is that we actually go from the acquired data back to this you know, object that we actually care about. So, or this image, rather. The object is the picture, or this drawing, or whatever, and then the image is the thing that we actually Questions? I mean, this is... Conceptually, I think this is a really important thing to understand, but it's also probably one of the more difficult things to understand in this case. Questions about what's happening here, or should we keep charging? Okay. So this is this is I, kind of one of the fun ways, and I've showed you this once before, but I think this is conceptually one of the fun slash easy ways to understand what a point in case space represents. So again, all I'm doing is heavily over-representing the presence of that particular spatial frequency, and you can see what it does to my you can see also that there's some really subtle changes to spatial frequencies in here, kind of all over K-space, if you will. 
And remarkably, those subtle changes correspond to rather dramatic organized changes in the actual image itself, right? This is the time resolved image of the heart, and this is the corresponding case space. So again, I think this is conceptually the easiest way to appreciate what a point in case space represents. Our job is to understand how we can use gradients to actually generate those kinds of patterns, and then the receiver system will receive that signal and interpret the presence or absence of that particular station. <coughs> Some other interesting things um, about case space. Sorry, these are supposed to be movies. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, we can talk about what's represented by the center of case space, where we need uh, the center of case space is low spatial frequency information, stuff that's not changing very quickly over space. And contrast information is really generally low spatial frequency information. So if I take just this middle chunk of case space and do a Fourier transform, I'll get this image that's on the right hand side. It should, I think, look a lot like the previous image. It's basically a lower resolution image of the same. It's lower resolution because I didn't go out to the edges of K-space, and the edges of K-space are the high spatial frequency information, right? High spatial frequencies correspond to little details, little edges, and, and all, the, all the good bits, uh, so to speak. And yet, it's the middle of K-space that really tells us about overall contrast. So here we can kind of make out, I can at least, that you've got something outside the chest, you've got a fat, um, layer here that's sub uh, sort of subcutaneous, and then I can just barely start making out the heart here, the liver, and the lungs. It's not great, right? It's a low spatial resolution image, and consequently doesn't have high spatial frequency information. Uh, the other thing we can do, I really wish this was a movie, sorry I didn't convert for some reason. Uh, the other thing we can do is just the opposite. We can take out the middle of case space and just reconstruct the edges of case space. And when we do that, we get this very unusual looking image here. It looks a little bit better as a movie because what you'll make out here is just the edges of the aorta, the edges of the ventricular wall, the edges of the chest, and of other sort of boundary tissues. And so, again, the high spatial frequency information in K-space really tells us about edges in our, in our image domain. <coughs> now, in principle, we want both, right? We want both contrast and edges, but there's a penalty to getting lots of edges, right? That takes lots of time. We're gonna, if we're going to cover a large part of K-space, that's going to require more time. Whether or not you can afford the time to do that experiment depends on uh, who's reimbursing you for the clinical scan, how favorably your chair views you, and how much research you do. Those kinds of things. Um, this, I think you guys probably have some, some familiar, familiarity with. And so I want to walk us back a little bit to just a 1D interpretation of K-space, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So here I'm just saying that any signal or any image can be decomposed into a summation of sine waves of appropriate amplitude, right? This is what Fourier sort of taught us. And so we take the, the white signal, uh, the white sort of curve to be the signal, and we're trying to reconstruct that signal uh, in the framework of uh, summing up a bunch of sine waves of appropriate amplitude. And so this is one sine wave that does okay, right? It's, it's a good first approximation to that underlying curve, but it's not, it's, a, it's not good enough. So it's a low spatial frequency, right? This could be time or space, but let's think of it as space, because this is an imaging class after all. So here's one Fourier component that's a pretty good match that underlying signal, but it's not good enough. But it's the best I can do with that, you know, by matching that particular spatial frequency to the underlying signal. And if I choose to add a higher spatial frequency, the, gray, the green curve, for example, and I add a degree in the red, now I get an even better approximation to my underlying object, if you will, which is the white dashed line relative to the solid one. And I can keep doing this, right? I can keep adding spatial frequencies of appropriate amplitude such that their summation gives me something really close to the underlying object itself. Here I only have four spatial frequencies, and I've got a reasonably good match between the dashed line and the solid one. So this is just the sort of qualitative principle underlying the, the Fourier. What we do in all these case space images that I keep showing you is we map out, uh, we, we're sort of trying to keep track of the amplitude of these different spatial frequencies. And so you can see, for example, that the red spatial frequency was pretty high in amplitude, the green one was lower in amplitude, the blue one was even lower, and the orange one was even lower. And so for that particular signal, one way of representing it is after the Fourier transform, we can create 
a stick plot, and the stick plot just tells us what's the amplitude of a particular Fourier uh, frequency, uh, and then we're mapping out the frequencies across the bottom, typically from low to high, as an example. When I show you these images of K-space, what we're really talking about doing is mapping uh, the, the height of these different Fourier components to a particular color map. And it seems common in the MR literature to use, or MR presentations, to use that hot color map that MATLAB offers, where really high amplitude things are white, and then it sort of merges through these sort of yellows, oranges, dark reds through black for low amplitude stuff. And so when you go back and look at those K-space images, if it's really bright, if it's really high, in if it's really sort of white, then that means that particular spatial frequency is high in amplitude, and it goes through this color map to get to lower and lower energy things. So there's a couple other uh, sort of introductory tidbits about case space and, and resolution and case space in the field of view that I want to touch on. Um, I'll use this rep representation several times. In the, in the back of this image, you'll see this, this case space, right, where there's really bright stuff in the middle. That's the low spatial frequency stuff. And then it gets darker and darker and darker as you get up to the edges. And the lines that I'm showing here are just representational. What if those were the lines I was acquiring as part of some experiment? So there's not a there's not a good correspondence, right, between the stuff that's shown in the background as representational and the you know sort of the example lines I'm saying. So let's assume that I acquired the solid lines and the dashed lines as lines of case space in my experiment. And then maybe if I take the Fourier transform of the acquired lines, then I can get a picture of my underlying object. In this case, it's a resolution pattern that we can use for characterizing how good our system is. Something that uh, hopefully stands to reason at this point, one choice you could make when you're acquiring lines of k-space is you can get fewer You can get fewer lines, right? Uh, what, it, uh, what you'll see is when I get fewer lines of k-space, I'm not getting those high, higher spatial frequencies, and the consequence is that the image itself looks blurry. I haven't resolved that, those edges quite as much. And so acquiring fewer high phase encodes uh, is going to decrease my resolution. Uh, hopefully that sort of makes sense in the context of Fourier sampling. Um, it's, in practice, though, it's not just going to change uh, the resolution of my image. What's it going to do to my, say, exam time or my sequence time? Sure. It's going to shorten it. Why? Because you're less space per second. Yeah. You've simply acquired, in this case, maybe two thirds or you know, half the lines that you were acquiring. And so consequently, you can scan faster. So again, everything in MR is trade-offs, right? Uh, if you want a high-resolution image, that's fine, but you necessarily have to get more lines of case space. Uh, if you're okay with fewer lines of case space to scan faster, that's great, but you will get a lower resolution image. Now, in, in, in MR research right now, people are trying to break these boundaries and break these barriers wide open. Uh, when they're looking at very unusual sampling patterns in case space, we still, for the most part, fundamentally do Fourier sampling with MR, but there's all kinds of wildly imaginative ways of acquiring case-based data and still trying to get back up to that image there. And that's a, that's a huge area of research that's related to compressed sensing and now machine learning is interested in this as well. Uh, I've only mentioned that as, as things that, uh, that you'll see coming if you stick around as a researcher in this field. Um, <laughs> something that isn't, isn't obvious, and we'll, we'll come back to this concept, we'll develop this concept uh, further at a later lecture, uh, but a good thing to remember uh, is one of one of few you know sort of worth memorizing equations, if you will, uh, is that the field of view. So when you sit down on the scanner, you pick the field of view. You usually pick the field of view to encompass the object that you're imaging, just big enough to capture their entire chest, just small enough to only image their knee. We adjust the field of view behind the scenes, and, and it's not an intuitive relationship until we get more further into the mathematics of it. But I want to introduce it today. Uh, behind the scenes, the field of view is related to 1 over delta k. And delta k is the step size between k points in k space. And in fact, we have a delta k in the x direction, and we have a delta k in the y direction. And those are independent. And what's interesting about that is it means that your field of view in the x direction and your field of view in the y direction, those can be independently controlled by how the delta k is chosen. Now, when you sit down with a scanner, none of us choose delta k. Right, what we do is choose the field of view. And then the system behind the scenes says, okay, fine. If that's your field of view, then this is what 1 over delta k needs to be. 
that's one over delta k needs to be, and then I can start calculating gradient amplitudes and so forth. And we'll see some examples of that when we talk about phase and frequency. Um, the funny thing that happens as a consequence of this, so in this example here, uh, my representational lines, I'm now only getting, say, the odd lines, right? I'm taking out the dashed lines, and I'm saying, well, what if I only acquired the odd lines? Uh, what happens to my delta k in going from, say, this acquisition strategy to this acquisition strategy? Does my delta k go up or down? It goes up, right? So the separation between my lines has gone up, let's say, by a factor of two. So if delta k goes up, what happens to my field of view? It goes down, right? And that gives rise to this very sort of famous artifact in all of MR called aliasing. It's related to how we're sampling the data. It's a, it's a problem, so to speak. It's an artifact. Uh, but if you choose your field of view to be too small, and you can do that on the scanner, right? This, you can do this tomorrow night. You can choose a small field of view. You will see an aliasing artifact. One way of understanding why that happens is in recognizing the relationship between uh, the field of view and, and delta k. Uh, and so uh, whether or not you actually see this tomorrow night sort of depends on what you choose to do in your lab. But this is a consequence of having too small of a field of view. So there's limits on how we have to sample case phase if we want to recover a useful uh, image of our and this aliasing artifact, it can be actually dealt with in sort of several different ways, uh, but in its worst case scenario, it's a, it's a um, sufficiently bad artifact that will obviously corrupt any sort of observation pressure. We'll come back to sort of where this comes from. Uh, okay, so uh, the next two things that we're gonna cover are both phase encoding and frequency encoding, uh, but it's just about the hour, so why don't we take a, a five minute break, uh, and, uh, and then we'll pick up again in Thank you.
<laughs> okay, uh, let's get going. So our, our job over the next, let's call it 45 minutes or so, uh, is to look at both phase encoding and, and frequency encoding. So phase encoding consists of a couple of different things, right? I'll, I'll show you an example of the whole sequence diagram a little bit later. Uh, but the phase encoding gradient consists of a mag has a magnitude that changes with each TR. So with every TR, you're acquiring a single echo. With every TR, you're updating which phase encoding step you're trying to acquire. This is at least the, the simplest example of, of, of how it proceeds. Uh, it turns out that phase encoding gradient can be played simultaneously with other gradients. And we'll, 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 we'll look at sort of why that's the case a little bit later. But uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, not so much crushers, but spoilers or spoiling the magnetization. Uh, we've talked a fair bit about the slice select rephasing gradient, and we'll talk today about a similar gradient called the read out dephasing gradient. The bottom line is the phase encoding gradient can happen at the same time as other events in our overall whole sequence. Uh, phase encoding is typically used with what we call Cartesian imaging, and this class is really only going to focus on Cartesian. That is, K space is a rectilinear grid of points we need to acquire, and we're going to find a sampling strategy where we acquire it line by line by line, and that's a Cartesian uh, trajectory. There, are, there is the flexibility in MR. You can steer your gradients however which way you want to actually map out different trajectories through K space. You can have radial trajectories, or spiral trajectories, or rosette trajectories, all, all everything that you can imagine has been explored. Uh, maybe not everything. Uh, lots of things have been explored. They all have their pluses and minuses, but it's, it's way too much to get into in this class, so we stick to just thinking in terms of so-called Cartesian imaging, rectilinearly moving our, our way through your case space. Uh, importantly, the phase encoding, here I'm just trying to give you a sort of qualitative understanding, right? It's going to happen after excitation. You obviously have to excite the slice before you can do any sort of encoding. And we want to do this before we do the readout, and the readout is associated generally with like forming the echo and also uh, the, the so-called frequency encoding. So it's an intermediate event, if you will. And what it does, in principle, is it adds a linear spatial variation to the phase of our underlying signal. Um, when a gradient is turned on and then turned off, that gradient being turned on will cause the frequencies to be different everywhere. And then if you turn that gradient off, the frequency will have processed for a certain amount of time, and that will mean you will accumulate a phase. And so if the gradient is on for a certain duration, the spins will accumulate a phase. If the gradient is simply on, then the spins have a particular frequency. But by, com by the combination of turning on a phase encoding gradient for a finite duration and then a frequency encoding gradient, we can manipulate both the phase and frequency of the, of the spin system. Uh, so just keep in mind that the, the phase encoding gradient will add a linear spatial variation to phase. And this slide is good to take in the context of the, there'll be a frequency encoding slide that's a lot like it, so you can kind of do a compare and contrast between phase encoding and frequency encoding once you've gotten through uh, both of these. Um, conventionally, we can phase encode in one direction for so-called two-dimensional imaging, and that's mostly what this class is about. We excite a slice, and then we have to encode the spatial information within that slice. One of the things that MR uh, can do is that it can actually do true three-dimensional 
uh, meaning you can excite a volume, the entire head, and you can encode uh, spatial frequency information across the entire head uh, uh, by applying phase encoding in more than a single direction. Uh, we won't get into too many details about that today. I'll, I'll revisit it if I can uh, uh, later in the class. Uh, and then in principle, there's only one phase encoding step per echo. We're going to excite, we're going to encode some information in that echo, record it, and then we're going to repeat that process uh, with as many phase encoding steps as we need to get all of the lines of case space in. And so a single phase encoding step is going to allow us to acquire, for example, the orange line that's shown here in this case. And we can manipulate that phase encoding gradient to go and capture uh, the other lines. In principle, it doesn't really matter if you, if you get that orange line first or last or somewhere in between. Uh, more typically, just maybe because it's logical and simple, uh, we typically will scan through case space from, say, top to bottom or bottom to top. Uh, we, don't that, we don't often sort of just skip around between lines, but uh, it's, it's certainly possible. And then uh, this is uh, well described at this point, but the Fourier transform of that, uh, of that acquired information will, of course, give us the image that we care about. So let's try to think again uh, about what's happening, about where we are in case space through the application of different gradients, right? So we've talked a fair bit about the first part here, which is excitation, the size select, the focusing gradient. Now there's two gradients that we can play actually at the same time as the slice select refocusing gradient. So while that slice select refocusing gradient is dealing with stuff through the slice, we can already get ahead of ourselves and start doing the phase encoding. Or the, for the example, the frequency encoding gradient, we have what's called the readout pre-phase encoding. So on the right hand side, what we see is this expression again between where we are in case space relative to the uh, gradient waveform that Typical gradient waveforms for us are going to be like box functions. Uh, box functions are some idealization of what we can actually do on the scanner. What we can actually do on the scanner is usually something more like a trap function. We have to ramp up to a plateau, and then we can hold it steady, and then we have to ramp down. And those ramp times are finite in duration. So it's an idealization to think of it as being a perfect uh, sort of rectangular gradient waveform, but we'll handle it that way at least for now. And so let's assume that this is our gradient waveform that we've chosen to use for something like phase encoding. Uh, uh, actually, I have these sort of out of order for some reason. The phase encoding gradient's on the bottom here. So if this is my phase encoding gradient, then this case space expression here, this is the definition of case space. It just tells us I'm going to accumulate or be farther and farther out in case space uh, for the longer and longer duration of my gradient. And so if this is my gradient waveform, I'm just moving out in case space in some linear fashion. Similarly, on the readout gradient, uh, it's maybe not entirely obvious yet, although you did already see this for uh, the context of gradient echoes. We have uh, an applied gradient waveform, and that applied gradient waveform also moves us out along phase space. Now, both these gradient waveforms are negative, and so that means we're going to move in the negative, negative quadrant of case space. And so as we look at these case space uh, trajectories, which are parameterized as functions of time, if we map those back to the case space, we can see that we'll start from the middle of case space and we'll move out to the negative, negative quadrant of case space. And that's all really just a direct function of this expression. So this is one way in which we can sort of conceptualize how we move around in case space through the application of different gradient waveforms. Now, if all I care about is getting to this end point, like let's, let's say that's what I actually care about, just getting out to this point, there's an infinite number of ways to get there. Right? There's all kinds of different gradient waveforms that will take me on different paths, different wiggly, winding paths through case space to that point. And as it stands right now, we only really care about getting to that end point. We want to get out to this point in case space so that we can then turn on the frequency encoding gradient and read from left to right. And so in principle, you can get there in different ways. We usually choose the shortest path. That's going to be fastest, and so that's why we typically use these kinds of gradient waveforms. Um, <coughs> The second part of this, about sort of where are we in case space, comes from the, just the second part of the frequency encoding gradient. So you've seen it a couple times, but this pre-phasing gradient in combination with the phase encode gradient just moves us out to the starting position that we really care about. And now we turn on an, an oppositely, uh, a gradient of opposite amplitude, in this case a positive uh, gradient amplitude, and that's going to move us along a single direction in case space because we're only turning on a frequency encoding gradient, not a phase encoding gradient. 
So we shouldn't move along the phase encode direction at all, but we should be moving along the frequency encode direction. And so what you see is that, in this case, we call it the readout gradient. The readout gradient is going to be of equal uh, but opposite amplitude, and it's going to bring us from that negative points in k-space and just linearly move us to different points in k-space as a function of time. But at the same time, we've chosen to not play a phase encoding gradient. So however much phase we had printed on our spin system at that point in time, it just persists. We've printed phase with this phase encoding gradient, and it just stays there. There's relaxation, but let's not worry about that for these short time events right now. And so the amount of uh, where I am in the phase encode case space direction just stays constant because I'm not perturbing it anymore. I haven't turned on any additional gradients. But the readout gradient now is moving me from left to right. So you, sh you should reasonably understand this expression, and you should, you should get some practice understanding how these gradient waveforms map to these kinds of case space trajectories, or even more so these kinds of case space trajectories. Um, I like asking those kinds of questions on the final. If I give you gradient waveforms, can you show me where I am in case space? Or if I give you a trajectory in case space, can you figure out the gradient waveforms? Yep. Um, so in this example, yeah. Yeah, sorry, right? Yep. And we're only listening during the echo, so that's why you will require moving down. Yeah, that's right. So, so typically, uh, what you're drawing out is that I have, I'm showing an echo here, and this echo corresponds to the free, this is called a frequency encoding gradient. It helps us form, in this case, the gradient echo as well. Right? That's also, I could have a fourth line here, which would be when I turn on my data acquisition system. In principle, there's nothing stopping you from having your, your ADC open. Uh, during times, any time you're moving through k-space, you could potentially do that. The only time you can't have your ADC on is when you're also excited. You can't excite and receive. You can excite or receive. So if you're done exciting and you want to turn on your ADC to, to listen to your coil of what's going on, that's fine. It just ends up getting complicated to sort of use the information that's happening along these sort of odd trajectories because they don't sort of fit in with this Cartesian sampling strategy of individual lines. Uh, there's a name for that, it's called ramp sampling. So you can sample, you can, you can do two things. You can sample on this pre-phasing interval if you want to. Um, and then if you notice, my, my gradients themselves actually have ramps, they're not perfect uh, rect functions. So there's actually some movement across k-space during this ramp. You could record that information as well. We typically don't. Typically we're just getting it on, uh, turning on the receiver during Um, so I, I, I said it a couple times, but I am fond of asking questions on the final related to sort of gradient waveforms and k-space waveforms. So where am I in k-space uh, given a certain gradient waveform, and what gradient waveforms would give me this trajectory through k-space? That's uh, a good working example there on the previous slide, but you should be able to qualitatively work through those kinds of examples to, to help cement that sort of connection. <coughs> So this is uh, just one more example. Uh, I said it before, the phase encoding gradient is the one that we're going to update every TR. Right? We have to move through different lines in k-space to get all of the lines so, so we can reconstruct the image that we care about. And different gradient waveforms are just going to give us different phase prints on the, on the magnetization. Right? We're basically printing the phase and frequency on the spin system, and the receiver tells you whether or not that particular you know, uh, pattern is present or absent in the underlying. And so these would just be different trajectories through k-space, and again, map to what's, what's being shown in, in k-space. Here, things are parameterized as a function of time, right? This is how k-space or the gradients are evolving as a function of time. If we map it all just into the two-dimensional k-space trajectory, then we can appreciate that using larger positive gradient waveform or larger negative gradient waveforms will pull us out along these different trajectories through k-space. And so the Qualitatively, this is sort of how it all works, and the business really comes into calculating what do these gradient waveforms actually need to be so we can move out to the positions in k-space that we care about, and oh, by the way, what points in k-space do we care about anyway, right? So we have to kind of link some concepts together, but this is mostly the, the qualitative description of that. Uh, and so we can see uh, what happens, how much phase do we accumulate as a function of space, uh, it just depends on the frequency of that position in space and how long that phase encoding gradient is turned on for, right? 
So the phase encoding gradients turned on for longer and longer and longer and longer, you accumulate more and more uh, underlying phase. How do we control the frequency? Well, we control the frequency through the applied gradient transform, right? And so the frequency itself depends on gamma times a field. And in this case, the field is the gradient amplitude itself times some position. So now the rate at which you're going to accumulate phase is going to depend on two things, the gradient amplitude and also how far away you are from isocenter. You'll accumulate phase more quickly distant from isocenter because you'll have a, a higher field effect when the gradient is effectively uh, stronger at that position. If we take the simple example of just having a, a rect function for our gradient waveform for phase encoding, then we just have a gradient amplitude, uh, just in, in general terms, times the duration of that gradient amplitude, times its position, and that will tell you how much phase is accruing at a particular, say, point uh, in the underlying object. And then we can map this back through our case space expression uh, to, to where we are in case space itself. But given a particular amount of uh, phase printing on the underlying object, this is uh, where we are in case space. Uh, one of the concepts that we uh, uh, alluded to but haven't gotten into the details of sort of really where it comes from is this idea that the field of view is just one over delta ky. Um, and so we know that we need a certain step size between our k lines uh, if we're going to image a particular field of view. Uh, the other thing we have to uh, uh, determine uh, is say the number of phase encoding steps. And so as a user, there's two things here you really care about. You care about your field of view. You want to pick your field of view to, to appropriately match the object. Right? We don't want a field of view that's 10 times bigger than the object, and we don't want a field of view that's substantially smaller than the object. If it's, really, if it's a lot smaller than the object, then you get this aliasing artifact. If it's a lot larger than the object, then you're probably just wasting time. So as a user, one of the first things you'll do is, one of the first things you pick on a scanner is the field of view to match the object that you're using. The other thing that you pick is the number of phase encoding steps, except for we call it something else, right? We don't actually pick the number of phase encoding steps. We usually choose our, like, our matrix resolution. How many, how many points do we want to acquire? Because the number of points we acquire divided into our field of view tells us about our spatial resolution. Right? If my field of view is 10, uh, 100 millimeters and I have 100 phase encode steps, then my spatial resolution is 100 millimeters divided by 100 steps, and I have one millimeter spatial resolution. So what we typically choose is something about our resolution and our field of view, and then everything else has to get sort of calculated. Um, so our delta ky is just one over the number of phase encode steps times delta y. This is just the field of view, right? The number of steps that you're going to acquire times the number of delta y physical uh, spatial resolution steps you're going to take. And so if you know you want to uh, get 128, and you can choose this in different ways, but if you choose 128 phase encode steps and you want those each to represent or be able to represent uh, say 0.1 centimeter or millimeter, uh, then the delta ky that you require is 0.07 centimeters. Uh, the other question is how, so that's our delta ky, that's sort of the scanner needs to know what's, you know, what gradients, we'll get to the gradient question in just a second, but uh, that's the delta ky that you need. The other question is how far out in, in uh, ky are you going to go? How many, uh, what's the maximum spatial frequency encoding strength you're going to acquire? Or use, and that's going to just be uh, because we do this sort of symmetric encoding about the middle of k-space. You have the number of phase encoding steps, sometimes minus one, uh, to handle sort of whether or not you're exactly at the middle, and then just half of that times your delta ky. And so this gives us our, our ky max uh, uh, spatial frequency that we're going to uh, uh, be imaging with, or could be imaging with, and we end up getting here uh, something like uh, inverse. Five centimeters, which will be over our will in fact be over our micro um, so let's see. Oops. Um, oh right. So then, then just mapping out. Well, what is what is the ky that I map for every single one of my steps? I have to go through 128 steps. I can index it, where m is just some integer from 0 to 128. Uh, then this is the ky that I'll be at for each of 
steps uh, times the delta k y that I calculated a second ago from the spatial resolution requirements. So that, that gives you some insight as to how the delta k y's and the k y max and the and the k y sort of lines themselves. Um, but now you can take we take those sort of algebraic expressions and think about well, how do we actually design the gradient waveforms, right? So how do we design the steps? Well, first thing is to calculate KY max from the defined number of phase encodes and the field of view. And that's going to define the largest phase encode step, right? How, if you have to get out to the edges of K-space, what's the biggest uh, phase encode gradient you're going to need? Um, and then typically we're going to design the shortest gradient waveform to achieve that KY max. And that'll be subject to maybe some hardware constraints. But we want to we want to build up that maximum area as quickly as we can because that's always going to be the most time efficient. And then we basically just have to linearly scale that gradient area for all of the other steps. Once we figure out the maximum gradient area that we need, then we just need half of that gradient area to get out to half, you know, to get out half as far in case space, for example. And so the most time efficient design thing to do is just to uh, just to scale uh, that gradient waveforms area to get you to the other lines in case space uh, that you want. And in, if you design it that way, then you're going to be keeping uh, the sequence timing constant from TR to TR. So in principle, for those really small phase input steps where you don't have to move out that far in case space, you could, you could achieve that in a very short uh, duration gradient waveform, uh, but that won't have the same timing as what you need to get out from those distant edges of k-space, we like to keep the timing kind of constant, so we just scale a larger gradient waveform uh, to achieve the other lines in k-space. So this we saw uh, earlier in the lecture, right? So the delta k y that you need is just one over the field of view. Typically we pick the field of view, and we don't actually really maybe care about what the delta k y is uh, behind the scene. But what does matter to us is what's the available gradient strength, and maybe what's the duration of the phase encoding gradient itself. <clears throat> and so the delta ky that you can achieve is related to gamma times the delta and the gradient strength. So you have these little steps in gradient strength to get to different lines in k-space. And then, of course, just the duration of that uh, phase encoding gradient itself. We can use these expressions in slightly different ways to calculate slightly different things. But in this case here, now relating what's the, what's the gradient needed, for example, to get out to our maximum ky point. It's going to be something about the number of phase encode steps that we need. And then we need to take into account the, the gradient strength step times the duration of that phase encoding gradient. And this will tell us, uh, you can invert this expression, right? You might want to solve, for example, for the maximum gradient strength needed to get out to that point if you, for example, fix the phase encoding duration. Usually the duration is fixed and we calculate it to this um, and the previous slide. So here we can look at a, at, a, at a more concrete example, right? And so we might need to know, well, what's the, we're trying to figure out the timing for this whole sequence. What's the, what's the duration of my phase encoding gradient going to be? Algebraically, we know it's related to uh, ky max. The farther I have to go out in, K, in ky, probably the longer my duration is going to be, especially given a particular gradient strength. Uh, if I have stronger and stronger gradients, then I can get out to, I can have shorter and shorter durations of phase encoding. And so there's interest, obviously, in MR and always having high performance, strong gradients. One reason is you can tighten up the duration of events, in this case, the duration of the phase encoding uh, gradient. So if you know that this is the maximum uh, uh, resolution that you effectively need, uh, and we know what gamma is, and we know what the gradient strength is for a particular system, maybe it's four Gauss per centimeter, then that tells us our phase encoding gradient is going to be about 290 uh, microseconds. And so again, just, just helping you get a scale, get a handle on what's the magnitude and duration of the phase encoding gradient's uh, amplitude, uh, as well as its potential duration. Um, so let's, uh, let's see if I can go to Well, it looks like it's going well. Okay. Uh, so, questions about phase encoding before I get into frequency encoding? I think there's a lot of there's a lot of jargon, unfortunately, and there's a fair number of sort of expressions that help you sort of understand this. But I think you have to kind of sit down and try to work through 
one or two of the examples that I went through, and then you know a couple a couple of iterations of that. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about frequency encoding then. I had a slide like this for phase encoding, and I was saying you can sort of do the compare and contrast, right? So a lot of the same concepts that are mentioned here are mentioned on that slide as well. So what's the frequency encoding gradient all about? Uh, well, it's going to be a constant magnitude for Cartesian imaging, and that's, of course, what this class is about. Well, importantly, when we do frequency encoding, you can't have any other simultaneous uh, RF, and you can't have other gradients. It's the time during which you're, you're basically listening. You're turning on a gradient so you can imprint different frequencies on your spin system, but it's a time when you're just listening. Uh, and if you turn on other gradients, then your trajectory through K space is changing, uh, and, it, and, and we can't simultaneously both receive and transmit uh, with, our, with the architecture of our systems. And so there's going to be no simultaneous RF, and there's going to be no other gradients applied at the same time. Um, and that was, that's a distinction if you go back and look at what we said about phase encoding. Uh, for the frequency encoding gradient, there's going to be this readout pre-phasing gradient. And there's different ways to sort of think about this. You saw this in the gradient echo lecture. It effectively prepares the, the spin phase so the peak amplitude occurs at the middle of the readout or occurs at the echo time. There are, as with all things, some, some ways that we can uh, slightly change that. But for the most part, it's going to give us peak echo amplitude at the middle of the readout plateau. So right smack in the middle of this readout would be the highest amplitude signal that we record. Uh, <coughs> that's sometimes called the readout dephasing gradient because you're sort of dephasing the system before reading out, uh, specifically so that it comes back into phase at a time you care about, which is the echo time. Uh, in distinction to the phase encoding gradient, here we're going to uh, add a linear spatial variation of frequency. If we turn a gradient on for a brief period of time, turn it off, we can imprint phase. If we turn a gradient on and leave it on, then we're imprinting frequency. Uh, and the frequency encoding gradient effectively is left on while we're listening and forming the echo itself. And so the combination of phase encoding first to print the phase, and then frequency encoding while we're recording the signal allows us to manipulate the phase and the frequency, and that's what we need to be able to do uh, to, to, to map out all the cases. Um, and then, in fact, this gradient itself helps us form the echo, right? It's sort, of, uh, it's sort of two things happening at the same time. One is this pre-phasing and the readout gradient will give us a strong signal at the echo time. But because we have this frequency encoding gradient turned on, we're actually encoding or printing frequency information at the same time. So it's sort of two for one. Sometimes. When we look at this, uh, the sequence, and, and in this example, we've, uh, we've already seen uh, earlier and sort of pulled in some of the phase encoding uh, slides. Uh, but the idea, this is the gradient that we're really talking about right now, and we should now understand how this frequency encoding gradient moves us out through k-space and allows us to get a line of k-space uh, uh, for every individual phase encoding step that we do. So with each TR will change the phase encoding step, but the frequency encoding step basically looks the same, because we're always just reading out, at least in this example, from left to right. It's just a question of whether we phase and go to the top or phase and go to the bottom. Okay, so what is this, uh, what, how does this all sort of come together? So that's our case space expression that we've seen several times relating gradient waveforms and case space uh, trajectories. Uh, for a constant amplitude gradient, uh, sometimes we just have gradient is turned on and then time is going to evolve. So uh, uh, the two pi brought over to the other side. Um, what this means is that, uh, and, and you've seen this sort of several times, uh, at any point in time, as long as I have that gradient turned on, I will be developing or printing different patterns like this on my underlying magnetization. Now to print a pattern like this that's at a diagonal, uh, I need to first do some phase encoding, and then I have to do frequency encoding. So the phase and frequency encoding together will print a pattern that's oriented something like this. That pattern's printed on my magnetization, pick it up in my foil, record it as, the, as some amplitude in, in case space. <coughs> this is just showing the substitution of how we go from, say, K, uh, K space to gradient waveforms themselves or durations themselves. Um, so we can think about the simplest example, right? When we're right in the middle of K space, right? So in the middle of K space, our, our, our frequency encoding gradient is just zero. 
at that point in time, maybe I haven't turned anything on. Uh, I don't need to turn anything on. I've prepared my spin system with some form of contrast. Uh, I've generated some transverse magnetization, and I just turn on my receiver. So in the absence of doing any phase or frequency encoding, all of my gradients are zero. My k-space position is just going to be the origin, the zero, zero position. So I reside somewhere here in the middle of k-space, and if I turn on my receiver and listen, what I'm getting is a sample of all of the magnetization across my entire slice. It tells me something about the total amount of signal, or the total amount of available magnetization, under the constraints of whatever preparation I was doing, whatever inversion pulse or saturation pulse I had. What happens next in both phase and frequency encoding is that by turning on gradients for finite durations, that's phase encoding, or turning on gradients uh, throughout the period during which I'm listening, I can move to different points in k-space. And I'll show you a, a couple examples of what this sort of really looks like. So this is the state of my spin system in the absence of a frequency encoding gradient. It's idealized, right? What is it, what is it saying? Well, let's imagine that the spin at a bunch of different positions is represented by these little magnets, right? And after an excitation pulse, uh, maybe there's an inversion pulse, maybe there's a teaching prep pulse, there's something that's changed the, the state of the magnetization. And now I've taken it and I've tipped it all over by a 90. That was my final excitation pulse, right, after whatever prep I did. So now my final excitation pulse has all of my spins pointing magically in the same direction. It's not really magic, it's, it's, it's idealized in that we assume our imaging system is sort of perfect and homogeneous and everything. So fine, I've tipped everything down. But nothing's static, right? The spin system is whipping around at 64 megahertz. If I turn on my receiver and I listen to that spin system, it'll process hundreds of times in a few microseconds, and I can record the amplitude of that total procession. If I do that, again, it gives me a sense for how much, you know, what's the presence or absence of the amount of spins I have for no spatial frequencies. What really gets interesting is, of course, the next step, right? So the next step is, Let's turn on a gradient uh, for some time. And if that time, I can choose the amount of time I turn that gradient on for. It could be a short period of time, it could be a long period of time. If it's a pretty short period of time, I'll generate a pattern of phase across my object. Right? What do I mean by a pattern of phase? Well, spins out of the edges of, of my object right, will have accumulated a certain amount of phase. But that's going to be different than the amount of phase that they're accumulating in different positions. Because in the presence of a gradient, my frequency varies as a function of space. So they're processing at slightly different frequencies. And if I turn that gradient on and turn it off, they will consequently accumulate different amounts of phase. And the pattern that I will have printed on in my magnetization could be something like this. And now I can turn on my receiver again and say, well, how much of that pattern do I have in my underlying object? And I can measure and record the amplitude of that, the state of the magnetization when that pattern is printed on my magnetization. Now, what makes one image different from another image is not this pattern that we print, but the, but the magnitude or presence of that pattern in the underlying object. And that, in turn, will depend on the T1 and T2 at this point, and the T1 and T2 at this point, and the proton density of the T1 and the T2 at this point. So whether or not you have a lot of that pattern depends on uh, how you manipulate the contrast uh, to begin with. You can leave that gradient on for longer, right? So these are just, uh, the longer and longer I leave that gradient on, the more I'll wind up the spin system, right? So the longer that frequency is operational, the longer it has time to print, uh, in this case, phase or frequency on the spin system, the higher and higher the frequency that I've printed on my spin system. And so at this point here, where I've gone for some, you know, three times some, some initial uh, duration, now I've printed this high frequency pattern on my spin system. And again, it's that pattern, but that pattern is processing at the larger frequency. That, that's what gives me induction and something I can measure. And so I can ask, is that pattern present or absent in my underlying object? And I can record the amplitude for that point in this case. Now, this is an example of what happens during frequency Think of it sort of in phase encoding or frequency encoding. Frequency encoding is continuous, right? We turn on a gradient and we're listening. And so every time we, cho we choose to listen for a short period of time, we call that the dwell time. 
and during the dwell time of getting hundreds of cycles of procession and saying, okay, that's how much, you know, that, that, that tells me about the presence or absence of this particular pattern. And that gradient's still turned on, and so it's winding up the phase to this pattern. And now I'm continuous, uh, continuing to listen during the next, say, dwell time. Hundreds of cycles of procession help me record my signal. My gradient continues to stay on, and this pattern slowly develops. And so you're continuously moving from this sort of DC state to these high spatial frequency states during the readout period. The phase encoding gradient does this discreetly. Right? The phase encoding gradient develops that pattern. And, and you'll notice, this is a pattern, in this case, this is a pattern that's only a left or right pattern. Right? It's not an up-down pattern. If I turn on the phase encoding gradient, now I can add an up-down pattern as well. So now I have an up-down pattern and a left-right pattern, and that's what has me sampling different points in K-space. And so if I develop, say, in this example, a pattern that has this frequency banding in the left-right direction plus the same frequency banding in the up-right direction, uh, the up-down direction, uh, then I'll be out of a point in K-space that's off on this map. And so try to, try to you know, sit back and think to yourself, why phase encoding imprints a phase on my object, and why frequency encoding transiently imprints a frequency. And then that combination of phase encoding, frequency encoding lets me move around to different points in phase space. Yep. So if the phase encoding would the uh, magnet rotate so we'd like see the uh, the white part or the red part in the static phase, it would shift it up. <laughs> it's a good question. And so what's being shown in this axis is that X and Y components of the magnetization, right? The only thing that can change uh, how much transverse magnetization you have is an RF pulse. Right? So only RF pulses force the magnetization from longitudinal to transverse. The gradients only act along the K direction. The gradients can only change sort of how rotated these spins are in this plane. So they will, as a consequence of a phase or frequency encoding gradient, in this example, uh, which I envision as spins that have been tipped by 90 degrees, they'll always look like perfectly half red, half white. What changes uh, will be whether the pattern is imprinting from top to bottom or left to right. In this case, the frequency encoding gradient is printing a pattern from left to right. There's no pattern going up and down, right? Every column is the same. When I turn on a phase encoding gradient, now I can actually change the pattern in the up-down direction as well. That's, I'm not showing that here. I'll show you an example, and that, that'll, that'll boil your eyes. It gets a little complicated to look at. I'll show you. Uh, questions about sort of how the gradients are helping us in this case? I'm, I'm mostly thinking this in the, of this in the continuous fashion, right? Turn on a gradient, we continuously are changing the state of the, of the, of the frequency. Uh, but discreetly, any one of these could represent an individual phase of coding. Okay, this is hard. I mean, this is, this is one of the, some of the harder concepts for this class. Uh, so this might be, uh, no, okay. So this is showing, this is another way of showing sort of the formation of the echo. So uh, what I, I don't know if this one lit up. I think it did, it's just fine. So what, you, what you're seeing on the right-hand side here is basically just the frequency encoding gradient. It's negative and then it's positive. What you're gonna see in just a second on the right-hand side is how the echo actually comes into formation. So when it loops over, you see everything's perfectly lined up, and now they're accumulating amounts of phase uh, until they start being it starts being undone by this positive gradient. Uh, it's a little hard to control here. Let's, let me see if I can hit it from the beginning. So here we're dephasing, and now the gradient's going to switch over. And now we're rephasing until a time at which the middle of the echo there, everything comes into alignment. Boom, and then they start falling out of alignment. And so this is effectively the action of that frequency encoding gradient on the underlying spin system. In this case, in the absence of any phase encoding, so there's no, there's no phase pattern uh, within the columns, right, from top to bottom, uh, the y, what we associate with the y direction. And so that's just uh, the dynamic version of what I was showing you on the previous slide. Okay, so let's, let's think about this, uh, some other aspects of this uh, of the uh, uh, frequency encoding gradient. Um, when we're recording signals with our, uh, uh, with our data acquisition system, there is this concept of what we call the receiver bandwidth. Uh, and we can choose to have high receiver bandwidth or low receiver bandwidth.
The receiver bandwidth is related to, uh, it's effectively related to what's the frequency width of, of an individual pixel. Uh, what's, so when we turn on a gradient, you have a range of frequencies. You can have a range of frequencies per pixel. And we call that the pixel bandwidth, so hertz per pixel. Other systems don't think of it in other MR systems. Uh, sometimes just think of it as total hertz, which is hertz per pixel times the number of pixels that you have. So slightly different ways of thinking about the receiver bandwidth. Uh, there's pluses and minuses. I'll use as an example high receiver bandwidth. And this is just a distinction to say low receiver bandwidth. So high receiver bandwidth means you need to use strong gradients during your readout. Uh, that will give you a larger range of frequencies across the field of view or across an individual pixel. What, this, what I'm getting at here is there are choices to be made in the amplitude of the gradient that you use for, for uh, frequency encoding or readout. And because we're also acquiring data at the same time we're applying that readout gradient, uh, a consideration is what we call the receiver bandwidth. High receiver bandwidths will have lower signal to noise, mostly because they accord with shorter acquisition times. Uh, if I move and you'll see how this comes together in a second, I hope, but as I move across case space very, very quickly, um, that will have the simultaneous effect of shortening my echo time. Uh, strong gradients will let me zip across case space. That will shorten my echo time, that's a good thing. But because I'm imaging quickly, uh, I'll, I'll have fewer cycles of precession relative to my noise floor, and so I'll have overall lower signal to noise. Um, the, an, an expression that links together What's the, what's the uh, receiver bandwidth that you uh, need or want? Uh, and its relationship to the gradient amplitude in the field of view is here. And obviously, we can pick two of these and then we choose the third. And so normally, what's chosen by, uh, by users is you usually pick your field of view. This is a natural choice to make. Uh, it's a little less obvious that you would choose your receiver bandwidth. But typically, we don't choose things like gradient amplitudes. Those seem to be the least, the least you know, the two of things to pick and those are consequently happening, right? So, uh, we perhaps know what our uh, temporal necro uh, sampling uh, requires. And so in this case, it would, it would be that the delta time for, a, for uh, receiving part of our signal would be one over twice the delta frequency, whatever the receiver bandwidth frequency is. And so we can, we can use these expressions to then specify uh, or, or we know rather from the case space the spatial sampling requirements where our sampling requirements are. So what's our delta kx in relationship to the gradient amplitude and the time steps that we have between uh, uh, k points. Um, so we can work this out in different ways if we want to, for example, figure out uh, what's our, if, if we define our delta x, that's a common thing to do on a system, uh, and we define our number of encoding points, then we can work out what's our delta k need to be. Uh, or if we, uh, again, define the number of encoding points and define our field of view, then it's pretty natural to say, oh, that gives us a particular spatial resolution. Uh, so I think this is just, uh, sorry. Uh, so this would be the receiver bandwidth that we might choose on the system. Typical receiver bandwidths are on the order of like 32 kilohertz, maybe all the way up to 128 kilohertz. This is the frequency range across the field of view. I turn on a gradient, and I have a range of frequencies across my field of view. And I can choose what that range of frequencies is going to be uh, by picking the receiver bandwidth, and then it calculates a gradient to, to, to use behind. We also typically pick the field of view, right? So our field of view is going to be maybe 30 centimeters, and that leaves as the free variable Then we have to calculate what's the gradient strength is going to be so that we can achieve the receiver bandwidth that we wanted and the field of view that we wanted. So this is just algebraic, uh, and it's, <coughs> excuse me, just says that the gradient amplitude that you would need during readout for that receiver bandwidth, uh, 32 kilohertz, and a field of view of 30 centimeters squirts out to about half a gauss per centimeter. Um, hard to have an intuition for you know how much gradient strength that is, but that's a pretty intermediate gradient strength. Uh, this doesn't typically push the limits of our systems. Our systems are pushed more for slice selection, uh, uh, more so than, than frequency encoding for uh, the case of Cartesian. Okay, so we can 
turn this around, we can think about uh, another component of this, which is what's the duration? Which is the duration of our readout gradient? And so if we know that we need a certain uh, sampling rate, delta t, which is just 1 over twice our, uh, our uh, receiver bandwidth, then we can figure out what's the delta time. And this is the time that accords with every little sample that we're going to measure. Right? So our receiver system is on, we're playing a bunch of gradients, and we're going to listen to our signal in discrete intervals. During this 15 microseconds, for example, we're going to get dozens, hundreds of cycles of procession and we're going to record that uh, using our digital acquisition system and then we're going to move on to the next time step and the next time step and our whole readout frequency encoding gradient is hundreds of time steps right so this just gives us a sense of what our dwell time needs to be our dwell time needs to be about 15 microseconds once and we can calculate that once we've chosen a particular receiver bandwidth the next question then is, well, what's the duration of my readout going to be? Well, it's just going to be the dwell time. Uh, this is just microseconds. So the dwell time times the number of points that you're ch you've chosen to acquire. And so typically in MR, we might get 128 points or 256 points. And so in this case, 128 points times 15 microseconds. 15 microseconds sounds pretty fast. But then you multiply it by 128, you say, OK, well, that's 2,000 microseconds. So for two milliseconds, I have my readout plateau turned on. Um, so this is just you know, giving you some insight, giving you some leverage for understanding um, uh, how you would calculate the duration of your readout. Now, interestingly, you can go back and look at what happens when you use, say, uh, let's say this example is for an intermediate gradient strength. You could choose to use a high uh, gradient strength, and that'll, that'll do a couple things. It'll change your uh, receiver bandwidth. It'll change uh, what you would choose to use as your receiver bandwidth. And then it'll in turn choose, uh, change, if you change your receiver bandwidth, say it goes up by a factor of two, what happens to your dwell time? Down, right? So if this goes up and this goes down, so your dwell time might drop to eight microseconds or something like that. And so if your dwell time is short, but you kept your number of readout points uh, the same, then your readout plateau uh, duration will time for the readout from say 2,000 microseconds to 1,000. So that sounds good. You've, you've gone faster by playing a stronger gradient, but the downside to scanning faster is that you don't have as many cycles of precession per dwell period, and that means you, you'll have lower signal to noise. You'll have just as much noise, but you won't have as many averages coming from all of those cycles of precession. So there's upsides and downsides always to whether you want high receiver bandwidth or, or low receiver bandwidth. Um, I think the last, <coughs> this is the last thing that shows up uh, for this lecture, uh, is just talking about um, uh, the readout prephasing gradient, right? So we know that we needed this readout gradient. This readout gradient is helping us form the echo, but it's also helping us print that frequency on the spin system uh, during the readout uh, plateau itself. And then uh, the area we need, we saw this develop in the gradient echo lecture, we saw qualitatively in the movies I was just showing, but the area we need for this pre-phasing gradient that moves us out to a point in K-space prior to sweeping across with frequency encoding where we actually acquire the data. The area that's required here is really just half the area of this readout gradient, uh, and so that can be achieved in different ways. Typically, you're going to want to use your maximum gradient strength, so this event can be as short as possible. It's only the area that matters. Uh, and that'll get you out to the point in K-space where you want to start uh, encoding from, and then you can zip across K-space uh, uh, according to uh, the parameters that you define for that gradient, usually through picking the receiver bandwidth and picking the resolution. Those are things we care about, you know, the gradient amplitude and the durations. Those things are kind of the um, Okay, so maybe just one last reminder of sort of where we are, right? We talked uh, in the last lecture about slice selection. The combination of the RF pulse and the gradient allows us to excite a slice. That slice will have through slice dephasing, so we have a slice select rephasing gradient that helps bring back some signal to noise. Now you've got your spin system totally prepared, you're ready for imaging, what do you do? You do linear combinations of phase and frequency encoding. You, you step through your phase encoding gradients, one per TR always playing uh, 
at least the first part is simultaneous, but always playing the same frequency encoding gradient. Together, those phase and frequency encoding gradients will move you across, say, different lines, to, out to different lines, and then across different lines of k-space. And at every line, and then all the points in the line, right, we're receiving the signal, maybe, or we're specifically discreetly sampling the signal maybe 128 times during this re-out plateau. Each one of those will give us uh, a sampling of the presence or absence of that particular spatial frequency that we're visiting, and that is completely governed by the gradient waveforms. Where we are in k-space is governed by uh, the gradient waveforms themselves. Um, we saw uh, that there are a couple ways in which this, the sequence efficiency can be improved overall by overlapping gradients. So this slice select refocusing gradient, phase encoding gradient, the readout prephasing gradient, those can all be applied simultaneously. That doesn't matter. We just have to make sure that when we finally get to readout, we're not doing anything else, because that's specifically the time our receiver system is on. We're getting our echo. That echo is giving us both the state of the transverse magnetization for each of these different spatial frequencies that we're sampling during that particular readout. So that's one way in which it all sort of comes together. Um, we're at the hour. I'll come